Hello viewers and welcome to my rebuttal of the April JW Broadcasting episode. This month's episode is hosted by Governing Body Helper William Turner Jr. So without further ado, let's roll the first clip. I'm 53 years old. I was known as a troublemaker. I was fighting in the bars. Come to a point where you begin to enjoy it. He was flat out scary. He was a, a very mean and violent man. Uh, so everybody kind of kept their distance from him. My language was detestable. I would make grown men blush by the things that I could say and things that I would do. I was involved with some bikers, and they were trying to prospect me into getting into their club. Things were escalating. We got married very young, and we were 17. And had my oldest daughter. I was the mom, and he, he lived a life of being out with his friends and partying. About that time, my wife started studying the Bible with Jehovah's Witnesses. It was a big change for her, but she explained the reasoning behind it. I couldn't argue with it. She talked me into studying. I studied from 20 years old to 30. I always seen it, always seen that it was good. I knew this is where I needed to be. Somehow I just could never break free of the person that I was. My mom always raised us in the truth growing up, and that's what we knew. So then to see my dad, where he was so different, but yet believed it to be the truth, and then to see that his lifestyle didn't do him any good was kind of a, a good example of a bad example, if that makes sense. So this is a fairly typical example of a JW Broadcasting testimony where you have this individual who led this debauched life and uh, I quote, he was mean and violent before becoming a Jehovah's Witness. The message here for me, at least, seems to be that you can't be a good, honest, fine, upstanding, moral, decent human being unless you're a Jehovah's Witness. And if you don't become one of Jehovah's Witnesses, then quite likely you're going to be mean and violent and lead this selfish, greedy, debauched life. Now, obviously, if you're a Jehovah's Witness watching this rebuttal, then quite likely you won't see it that way. But bottom line, what we're seeing here is video material that's been produced by Watchtower that conveys a message. And that message is that if you're not inside Jehovah's organization, then in all likelihood, you'll be a very unpleasant person wanted to be a better person. I truly knew that this was just not a way of life that I wanted anymore. He changed his friends, he changed his life, he changed his dress and grooming, he changed his speech patterns, he changed the way he was a grandfather, he changed the way he was a father, he changed the way he was a husband, everything changed about him. I knew of the work that witnesses do, going out door to door, talking to people. I thought I could never do that. Whoa, me going door to door, I'm going to run into people that I know that I drink with for years and years. How can I face them now? I had always told my wife it would be much easier for me to become a witness if I didn't live here. But how wrong I was because what a witness. My changes have been to so many people in town. One of my favorite things to do is uh, bridge witnessing with my granddaughter. People are fishing on the bridge. I've been there all night. I even have return visits that I do because people regularly come down on the weekend to fish on the bridges. I seize every opportunity. <laughs> my kids laugh at me. Who witness to anybody, anytime, anywhere. You'll see some uh, raggedy, taggy, old, rough guy that uh, he, he knew and brought to the Kingdom Hall. In a few weeks, he's got a new suit on, got a haircut, clean shaven. Uh, it just, this is the effect he has on, on the people that he comes in contact with. I love life now. I have true friends. I know that I have hope for the future. Jehovah has seen something in me, and he's brought it to light. 
accepted. I am a good person. I can be a good human being. I can help other people. I can be loved by him. It's priceless. Are you a Bible student who is undecided on whether to commit your way to Jehovah? Take note of the trust and confidence Brother Brown showed in dedicating his life to God. One of these days I am going to do, I swear, a compilation of all of the clips from JW Broadcasting episodes from when they first began of witnesses crying or tearing up or getting emotional on camera. And again, this is a very clever ploy. Works every single time, no matter how good or bad your argument is. If you can show people getting emotional to the point where a grown man is about to cry on camera, your message will be compelling. It could be a terrible message, but by bypassing logic in that way and showing people's emotions, you are going to string people along with whatever it is you're selling. It's a very clever ploy that Watchtower uses, and again, we see it again and again. But as for this testimony, well, it goes without saying that just because a man changes his behaviour, that doesn't mean he has found God's one and only truth. I'm sure there are any number of high-control cult-like groups where the same thing can be said. Oh, Joe completely changed. He was no longer violent and thuggish. He was uh, suddenly clean and upstanding and respectable. I'm sure there are any number of groups that could have that effect on someone. So just because this individual changed his behavior, that says nothing about the truth of his beliefs. The theme of our broadcast is a very comforting one. Being securely wrapped in the bag of life with Jehovah. Perhaps the thought of being securely wrapped makes us think of a safely swaddled baby or being enveloped in the warm blanket on a cold night. In the Bible, these words were uttered by the woman Abigail to Jehovah's servant David. Being securely wrapped in the bag of life with Jehovah. Well, that has to be a winner, I think, when it comes to the most bizarre titles for JW Broadcasting episodes. But in all seriousness, I find this month's episode fascinating because usually when you're watching JW Broadcasting episodes, it comes across very strongly that witnesses are being talked down to and treated like children with the very dumbed down language uh, and, and the very overly simplistic way that these broadcasts are presented to the point where rudimentary words need to have the definitions explained. Well, here, they're almost celebrating that. They're saying, well, we want you to feel like a baby. We want you to feel swaddled in Jehovah's bag of life. And this for me is one of the clearest indications yet of Watchtower infantilizing Jehovah's Witnesses, making them feel as though they're children. Because if you can convince someone that they are effectively a child and helpless and can't look after themselves, you stand a much better chance of controlling them. When someone rises up to pursue you and seeks your life, the life of my Lord will be wrapped securely in the bag of life with Jehovah your God. But the lives of your enemies he will hurl away like stones from a sling. Just as we might wrap up something valuable in order to protect and preserve it. Abigail was telling David that is how his life would be in Jehovah's hands. When we dedicate our lives and vow to serve him unconditionally, we gain an approved standing with him. We're figuratively put in that bag of life. And as we work to develop a close, personal relationship with him, then we can experience Jehovah's friendship and protection. We would never want to restrict Jehovah's protection by not looking to him for guidance or relying on our own thinking. Just as I said, Jehovah's Witnesses need to feel helpless and totally reliant on the organization. We even hear there William Turner talk about Jehovah's Witnesses serving Jehovah 
unconditionally. If you can dedicate yourself to Jehovah, and when we say Jehovah, we essentially mean Jehovah's organization, because it's Jehovah's organization that speaks for Jehovah. If you can give your life to us, then guess what? We are going to treat you like a child. You won't need to worry about having to make any sorts of decisions because we're going to make all of your decisions for you to the extent of telling you what you can wear and how your dressing and grooming should be oriented. We will micromanage your lives for you because guess what? You are now in Jehovah's bag of life. Now, can we think of areas or situations that might require us to wait on Jehovah? Perhaps we're experiencing literal opposition at work or at school. Like Abigail, you might face the challenge of living with a difficult marriage mate. Maybe we're battling a health issue and loyalty is needed regarding our medical choices. Or it may be that we live in a country where we cannot preach freely or we face opposition for our beliefs. Really, it could be any number of situations, but it is our response the way we handle the situation that indicates how much we are allowing Jehovah to help us. Do we trust him enough that we can leave the matter in his hands and see how he works things out in our behalf? I mean, the manipulation is just astonishing. It's so obvious. Even in cases of medical choices, do you show loyalty when you are presented with a medical choice? Do you use that opportunity to show loyalty to Jehovah? I think we know what William Turner is talking about there. Because although there are a number of areas in which Watchtower likes to interfere with people's medical choices, the number one has to be blood transfusions. So are you willing to trust Jehovah? To show that you trust Jehovah by... <laughs> by giving all of your decision-making over to Watchtower and letting them decide for you whether you can accept blood or not, even to the point of allowing yourself to die rather than accept a blood transfusion. That's what William Turner is saying here, but he dresses it up as being uh, a, an area in which witnesses need to show loyalty as though they're cowards if they don't give all of their decision-making ability over to Watchtower. Our consistent routine of study, meeting attendance, and the ministry will help us remain busy, stay active, and make good decisions. We'll have no time to become curious or occupied with the things this world has to offer. Yes, we don't want you to get curious. We absolutely don't want you to get sidetracked by anything the world has to offer, including facts <laughs> and science and education and critical thinking skills. So we'd actually rather you remain busy. A amazing that he can say this without realizing how this sounds. He is telling witnesses that it's good to be busy for the sake of being busy. Because at least if you're busy, you're not gonna get distracted. So it doesn't actually matter whether what witnesses are doing is useful to Jehovah or not. It doesn't matter whether they are necessarily bringing people into the organization by doing their preaching work. Oh, well, never mind that. At least you're being busy and not getting any opportunity to realize that you're stuck in a cult. As we face difficult situations in life, may we look for opportunities to show and develop our Christian qualities, such as patience and reasonableness. These qualities show Jehovah that we want to be like him, that we have the mental disposition of Christ, and that we will allow him to guide us constantly. Next, may we keep focused and busy in the work of the Lord, by drawing close to Jehovah through prayer and engaging in spiritual activities, we make the best of our situation now. But we will also find everlasting protection in Jehovah's hands, safely swaddled and securely wrapped in his bag of life. Just like babies, which is what we need you to be. We need you to be helpless. 
we need you to feel as though you need to have everything decided for you. And guess what? We're ready to decide things for you. Um, honestly, William seems to me, I mean, I have no reason to assume he's anything other than a decent, upstanding person. He, I would go as far as to say he probably doesn't deserve to be in a cult. But what he's doing here, and I have reason to believe that that, that those who present JW Broadcasting episodes write their own material. I think he's written this. And what he's written is, uh, is a speech that celebrates being in a cult and celebrates the helplessness of being in a cult and celebrates the futility of it. Because when you become a Jehovah's Witness, you relinquish your decision-making abilities to the point where you should be willing to die, if necessary, as a show of loyalty to Jehovah's organization. We need to rely on Jehovah's guidance even in the most severe trials. It's possible that you may face a life-threatening issue where there's no desirable option but a decision is necessary. In the following dramatization, Emma is faced with a situation like this. What will she do? And how will God's Word help her to make a decision? When Thomas and I first learned I was pregnant, we were both really shocked. But then we grew more and more excited. And we were so thrilled when we saw our little girl for the first time. We really didn't care if it was a boy or a girl. We just wanted the baby to be healthy. Unfortunately, our hopes were completely destroyed when the doctor told us that the baby would likely be born with severe problems and could even die. Good. My husband and his parents are not Jehovah's Witnesses, but they do feel abortion is wrong. Still, they thought that we should listen to our doctor's advice. I couldn't believe this was happening. I even questioned why Jehovah would allow it. I really felt it was more than I could bear. Thomas asked me what I wanted to do, and I told him that I could never have an abortion. He agreed that normally it would be wrong, but felt that in our situation, God would understand. So yes, we're dealing with abortion. And if these characters seem familiar to you, it's probably because we've seen Emma and Thomas, this fictional couple, appearing in the July JW Broadcasting, which I covered in my last JW Broadcasting rebuttal. Um, although that that would be JW Broadcasting number 44 and this is JW Broadcasting 41 and I was able to release 44 ahead of 41 because the July episode was leaked to JW Survey. But anyway, we have this recurring couple who probably are going to pop up again in other JW Broadcasting episodes in the same way as we see Aiden or Aiden's family. You, may, you might remember the young child who has this dilemma about signing his friend's birthday card. You seem to see his family popping up quite a bit as well. So seems to be a new, a new strategy that Watchtower is employing to stick with the same characters. But anyway, you have Emma and Thomas who are grappling with this dilemma about abortion. And right away, it's worth noting that abortion is a very difficult subject to deal with. Uh, my own view on abortion is that it's never nice to have to abort um, a life. It's, it would always be preferable 
given the unlikelihood of that life ever coming into existence, I've touched on that in other videos, it's always, it's always preferable, wherever possible, to give life a chance. But it isn't always that simple. And rather than um, give a, an arbitrary command that no one's allowed to get any abortions, it seems logical to allow the, the mother whose body, is, <laughs> whose body is in question here, seems logical to allow her the choice. And what's dangerous in, in this particular video is the fact that the doctor is giving advice and the witnesses watching are being told that the doctor's advice should probably be ignored. I think, as I'm going to say, as I'm going to argue again, I think this sets a very dangerous precedent. But anyway, back to the dramatisation. Emma and Thomas have this dilemma. They need to decide whether or not to abort the child because it will very likely be born with complications and not live very long. They have this dilemma and we're about to find out what decision they make. I was so overwhelmed. I was being pressured to make a decision I knew was wrong, but that everyone was telling me was best for my child. I had never felt so alone. I needed Jehovah more than ever so I poured out my heart to him in prayer. And then I did research. I showed Thomas the scripture I had found. If men should struggle with each other and they hurt a pregnant woman, if a fatality does occur, then you must give life for life. Jehovah views even the unintentional killing of an unborn child as a serious sin. So how could we intentionally take the life of our child? Two things here. First of all, you'll have noticed that shot where Emma is uh, at her computer and uh, it said that she's doing research and you see the image of the Watchtower online library pop up very, very strong visual cue that when it comes to research, when whenever Watchtower refers to research, what they mean is in Watchtower publications. In other words, it would have been silly for Emma to do research outside of Watchtower publications about this grave decision that affected her body and, you know, with huge ramifications. No, the, the, the port of call, ladies and gentlemen, is Watchtower Online Library, is Watchtower Publications. That's where you're to get your answers from. So very disturbing cult-like message right away. Then we have this woefully applied scripture, which does say that in a particular instance, there should be penalties for injuring a pregnant woman so that the woman's baby dies. That's what the scripture says. But as per usual, <laughs> Watchtower goes one step further and says, well, because of this, this applies. Because of this particular scenario in which a pregnant woman is injured and loses the baby, therefore abortion is wrong. That kind of black and white thinking, again, is very dangerous. Because what you can then have is a scenario where a mother could conceivably die by refusing an abortion. Yes, that happens. And if they're gonna take this advice that Watchtower is giving under the pretext of it all being in the Bible, oh, well, it's not just us saying it, 
This is what it says in the Bible. When the Bible isn't saying that at all, it's giving this particular scenario of two men fighting. Nothing to do with should women have this procedure if there are complications with their baby. You can see the danger here. You can see how this could actually lead to Jehovah's Witness women dying because they're being told here that under no circumstances is abortion okay. So therefore, well, I need to be loyal to the death because we're supposed to be loyal to the death when it comes to blood transfusion, so the same would apply here. I made my decision clear to our doctor. Thank you, I'll have a look at that later. And to my in-laws. There was a chance the diagnosis was incorrect, and I'd love to say that that's what occurred, but it did not. My daughter Chloe only lived a few weeks after she was born, and losing her was the hardest thing I've ever had to endure. But Jehovah gave me the courage to explain my beliefs to my husband, my in-laws, and the medical staff, and they all expressed admiration for my strong faith. And I've never regretted the decision I made. Even though Chloe only lived those few weeks, I'm so grateful for the time I had with her. I know Jehovah remembers every detail about her and he'll give her back to me in the resurrection, in perfect health, because all life is truly precious in his eyes. Getting Jehovah's thinking on a matter should be the first thing we do when making decisions. This is especially true when well-intentioned friends or family offer advice that may conflict with Bible principles. As we weigh a variety of options, follow Emma's good example of consulting God's Word in our Christian publications. This will help us make decisions that bring honor to Jehovah. Yes, William, it did come across loud and clear that Jehovah's Witnesses are to get Jehovah's thinking on the matter. When they face these incredibly difficult decisions, they need to go to Watchtower Library. They need to go to Watchtower Publications because why would they? How could they possibly think that they could make these decisions by themselves? That would mean that they would be free-thinking adults. And Watchtower needs Witnesses to feel like children to feel swaddled in Jehovah's bag of life, so that even decisions like this are taken out of their hands and made for them by the governing body. I have to say, it feels like I say this in every JW broadcasting rebuttal, but this is one of the most disturbing things I've seen, I think, because of how dangerous it is. And I've already said, if you are a woman, a Jehovah's Witness woman watching this and you are in a situation where your doctor is telling you you need an abortion, even if, I mean, let's say that you your life is in danger if you don't have an abortion, what are you going to be thinking after watching this episode? Just because it wasn't like that for Emma doesn't mean that it won't be like that for Jehovah's Witness women who are watching this and they're being told here, well, under no circumstances, under no circumstances is it ever okay to have an abortion. Well, I'm sorry, but that logic kills people. That logic kills women. And Watchtower, you are a disgrace for telling millions of Jehovah's Witness women that under no circumstances can they have an abortion. Almost from the start of the marriage, it was not running smoothly, to say the least. We were fighting constantly. Uh, even the smallest things we would, we would argue over uh, and it would just get blown out of proportion. We couldn't communicate without it being an argument. Steadily, the arguments increased in frequency um, and intensity. And you think, well, I'm not happy here. Um, and that's when, yeah, I threatened to leave. Sometimes I felt like completely giving up on the marriage. There would be arguments where you're packing the bags and saying you'd wish you'd never done it. Ultimately, it would end in insults and... Jehovah was missing out of our marriage. 
and that was the essential part of making our marriage work. Newsflash, not all marriages are blissfully happy, certainly not all the time. Whenever you have two adult humans in close proximity, they are going to disagree. Sometimes they're going to disagree strongly. Sometimes they're going to argue. Sometimes they're going to hurl insults. It just happens in any relationship, but especially a marriage, when you have people literally living with each other every day. But what, what married couples are being told here is that it is impossible to navigate these issues unless you are a Jehovah's Witness and unless you apply Jehovah's Witness teachings or the Jehovah's Witness interpretation of certain scriptures that relate to husbands and wives. That's the message of this little segment. And I'm sorry, it's just not true. You can have a happy marriage without being a Jehovah's Witness. Ephesians 5.33 eventually had an impact on me because there were articles that pointed out how important it is for a husband to feel respected by his wife. And I don't think I'd ever really appreciated that before. I just viewed it as a mechanical process. He's the head, he needs to have respect from his wife. I didn't recognise that it's important for a husband to feel respected, to then be able to take on his role as head. We're so thankful to Jehovah for his, his patience. The Bible principles were always there. Uh, we just weren't making application of them. As soon as we started to make application, our marriage did a complete turnaround. Where we are now is, is totally different. The, the relationship that we have is what we wanted in the start, but didn't know how to get it. It's just that application of Bible principles that's made it possible. Well, isn't that interesting? It turns out it's all the wife's fault because she wasn't lavishing her husband with automatic respect the way the Bible commands women to respect their husbands. And I guess if you're a Jehovah's Witness watching this, you will try and excuse the sexism by saying, oh, well, um, it says it has advice for husbands as well. We're just hearing the advice about wives. There's also advice in the Bible for husbands <laughs> about honouring them as a weaker vessel, which, which is, isn't sexist. But honestly, you, you have to admit watching this, it's all on her. And what she's saying there, I mean, quite apart from the fact that all of this has something to do with headship, just because he's a man, he is in a position to be the leader in that relationship. Quite apart from all that, listen to what she's saying about respect and tell me why those exact words shouldn't be applied also to a husband respecting his wife. Why the onus on the wife rather than the husband? Why not say, in the same breath, a wife should respect her husband and a husband should respect his wife. It immediately becomes obvious when you examine the context in which, in which these words are written. They're written by a man, the Apostle Paul, who also thinks women should be silent. Then it starts to make sense. We were 17 actually when we met, 20 when we got married. Life was good for Tony and I, we, mm. were, we were happy. But then I got into another business that uh, became the main focus in my life. It had a, quite a dramatic effect on our spirituality. We went through some time there where we hardly saw each other. So there was a great deal of time that we spent apart. Bible principles were ones that weren't brought into our life. At that time, Bible reading was out of the picture. I started delving into viewing things that were really, really inappropriate. And, and then it eventually happened where I didn't really care what I viewed. And I didn't think about the consequences and of the unhappiness that it would cause. It made me feel very, um, extremely unloved. I felt very angry about his behavior I felt a lot of resentment towards him, a lot of bitterness. We ended up in um, separation to begin with. I left Tony 
I walked away from him, I walked away from the marriage, walked away from the business, and eventually it ended up with me unscripturally divorcing Tony. I think I can see what Watchtower is doing here. I think they're trying to balance things out. So in the previous testimony, we had the wife who was basically confessing to not sufficiently respecting her husband. And now it's the turn of the husband in this case. He's been viewing something he shouldn't have been viewing. I think we can say porn. I doubt it, he's, they're referring to nature documentaries or... <laughs> I can't see how it could be anything other than porn. I'm willing to be... I'm willing to stand corrected there. But what really stands out for me in, in this testimony... Well, for, well, there's two things. First of all, they met at 17 and they were married at 20. And I can fully see how that could be the case in Jehovah's Witnesses. Because when you're sexually repressed as a Jehovah's Witness to the point where you're not allowed to masturbate, you're not allowed to marry outside of your faith. So you have a very finite, a limited number of potential partners to the point where <laughs> to the point where it's almost like musical chairs where you have to grab <laughs> grab one while you can if you want to stand a chance of having sex at any point and this couple it looks to me i again i'm willing to be proven wrong it looks to me like they are victims of the sexual repression that is intrinsic in growing up as a jehovah's witness they probably aren't right for each other and that's probably where all of this has come from. They got married at 20 and both being Jehovah's Witnesses, they were then locked into that relationship to the point where Rhonda divorces Tony, which was probably the right thing for both of them. But guess what? She couldn't scripturally divorce Tony because whatever Tony had been doing let's say he was viewing porn, it wasn't adultery. He hadn't gone that extra step. So therefore, Rhonda couldn't get a scriptural divorce. And therefore, there was no other man that she could move on to. She couldn't remarry without herself committing adultery first in order to sever the relationship. Because according to Jehovah's Witnesses, you cannot have a divorce without d adultery by one of the two parties. This is tragic when you think about it. And I, I can't help but watch this and think, well, how many couples are there who did get married at 20 or even younger and who aren't right for each other and who are locked into this situation, into this unhappy marriage or a marriage that doesn't work for whatever reason because they didn't know themselves when they got married, let alone knowing the other person, it's, it was basically, it was only a few steps removed from an, from an arranged marriage. This sort of thing is inevitable. The elders that were uh, assisting me, they helped me to see exactly how Jehovah felt about what I'd been doing, where my relationship was with him, and it was quite poor. I felt, due to the betrayal that I had experienced, I did not have a problem with my conscience at all in going through the divorce. It seemed the logical and the best way for me to go. Then with my Bible reading, I got to see Amos 5, 15. It really had an effect on me because I needed to hate what is bad and love what is good. One scripture that affected me was how Jehovah felt about divorce from Malachi. Altogether, it took us 15 years before we got together again. Mm. I was just enjoying a day out in the field midweek and I uh, get home in the mid-afternoon and all of a sudden my mobile phone rang and uh, I heard Rhonda's voice and what a delight it was when she was inviting me to accompany her to a cup of coffee somewhere to talk about things. If I didn't start having the scriptural intake and learning to love God's Word, uh, my life wouldn't have changed. Without the Bible, Tony and I would not be together. Mm. Um, the marriage would never ever have reconciled. We have become best friends, so we really enjoy being in each other's company and 
um, serving Jehovah together. Married life now has certainly been benefited between both of us to see how beneficial the scriptures were. Tony and I now are very much a couple and so no matter what we deal with, it's, it's us together. When situations like these arise, it's not just our marriage that's affected. Our relationship with Jehovah is on the line. I just felt this story was, it just feels tragic. Feels like I'm watching some kind of really cringeworthy, you know, documentary. I mean, maybe it's just me. It's very, very easy to read too much into these things, but that couple just look odd next to each other. And when she's asked about the, her decision to divorce Tony, Rhonda says that she felt it was the logical and the best way for me to go. So it's it's not like, well, it was how I felt at the time, but I'm really glad that I was pulled from the brink. It, it's almost like, no, I, I should have divorced him, but... I'm so glad that the Bible forced us back together. And make, make no mistake, this couple has been forced together. They have. Because Rhonda wasn't allowed to remarry, according to um, witness rules on marriage, that incidentally put women's lives at risk. Because even if there is abuse, even if there is violence in the relationship, even if a husband is beating his wife, that is not grounds for a divorce. So you're, you could have a violent spouse and you're still not allowed to divorce them. You still have to remain married to them, even if you get a divorce, even if you go through the proceedings and, and get your divorce certificate through, in the eyes of the congregation, you're still married to this man. Woeful, woeful um, teachings and policies that again put women at risk and not at all to be celebrated and bottom line the message here again is you can't have a happy marriage unless you apply not just the bible but watchtower's interpretation of the bible and i would simply argue that i'm sure there are countless examples of marriages that are happy and fulfilled and respectful outside of the Jehovah's Witness faith. In our program, we've seen a few ways that Satan will exert pressure on those securely wrapped in the bag of life. True Christians courageously stand up to the devil, never allowing him to pry us away from Jehovah's protection. At a recent Bethel morning worship, Brother Mark Sanderson of the Governing Body discussed 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9 and outlined how we take our stand against Satan. Is it possible to survive the attack of a roaring lion? Well, now, I did some just quick checking on various wildlife websites, and here's what they say. Basically, they all give the same advice if you're being attacked by a lion. They say, hold your ground, never run, or turn back. In fact, one, uh, one website says, a lion can run 50 miles per hour, so stand still. If you run, you will only die tired. <laughs> well, that's true. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 9 gives us exactly the same advice. It says, take your stand against him. Well, in this case, not against a literal lion, but against that roaring lion, Satan the devil, who is seeking to devour every single one of us. Here's just a couple of experiences that really touch my heart. Here's one uh, about a brother named Pavel from Russia. In 1958, Pavel was arrested for religious activities. Accompanying me to the train, he says, the officer with me said, look at your wife for the last time because you will never see her again. Well, there's the lion. I spent six months in solitary confinement before my trial. During interrogations, the investigators did everything to undermine my faith. Sometimes violence was used. I begged Jehovah to give me the strength to stay firm. But now look what happened. During a routine interrogation, the investigator called me into his study and he said, 
Now we will show you what your organization is doing. Then you can see if it is God's work or not. Looking at me intently, he continued, This year, your convention in New York was attended by 253,000 people in two stadiums. The convention lasted eight days. The investigator strewed the table with photographs. In one of them, I saw happy delegates in colorful native dress embracing one another. Another photo showed Brother Knorr giving a talk, and yet others showed the baptism. The investigator could not even imagine what I was feeling at that moment. I felt that I was attending the convention without ever having leaving the prison. I felt new strength flooding into me. It was just what I needed, and Jehovah generously blessed me in a special way. I was ready to endure further. Isn't that amazing? Um, not really, Mark. What you've just told us is a story of a really, really, really incompetent interrogator who believed he could break a Jehovah's Witness by reminding them or telling them about this wonderful convention that he was missing, which gave him further motivation to continue loyal as a Jehovah's Witness. I don't know what the grand message is behind this story, aside from, as we're going to see another example of, reminding Jehovah's Witnesses that they're persecuted, reminding them that Satan's system is out to get them, and how tragic that the Russian government, in its ban of Jehovah's Witnesses, is continuing that legacy, is continuing that line of stories, so that there will be stories for decades to come along these lines. And how interesting as well, when Mark Sanderson was talking about the Roaring Lion, and he said that the Roaring Lion was Satan, and that Satan's out to get us. This is exactly the kind of fear-mongering that you find in Watchtower Propaganda. And it shouldn't work, but it does. When you're watching this as a Jehovah's Witness, you do feel, oh, he's right. He's right, Satan's out to get me. And I need to show loyalty. If ever my loyalty is tested, I need to come out on top. I need to prove to Jehovah that I take his requirements seriously. Absolutely typical Watchtower propaganda. Here's another similar experience. 1960, also in Russia, a large publicized trial of Jehovah's Witnesses. About 300 persons were present in the courtroom, including many of our brothers and sisters. Well, as the evidence, as evidence against the brothers, the prosecutor decided to present a letter from Nathan H. Knorr. One of the brothers who attended the trial said this, the prosecutor loudly began to read a letter that had been intercepted by the KGB from Brother Knorr to the brothers in the Soviet Union. For all of us witnesses present in the hall, it was a wonderful gift from Jehovah. The letter warmed our hearts. We heard wise counsel from the Bible and encouragement to serve our fellow believers lovingly and to stay faithful even under trials. The prosecutor read the letter from beginning to the very end. We listened with rapt attention. It seemed to us that we were attending a convention. Well, now, brothers, what additional lessons do we learn from these two experiences? We learn that far from being a roaring lion, Satan's system can be really, really lousy when it comes to their attempts at attacking Jehovah's Witnesses. Again, you've given us an example of incompetence of a prosecutor reading a motivational letter from a cult leader to his followers, assuming that that's going to have any other impact than to motivate his followers and make them think, fantastic, I'm going to carry on with this cult because I've just been, I've just been given this pep talk by my president in the courtroom, no, no less. We learn that it's not really a roaring lion. We learn that it's actually quite clumsy and quite incompetent. And we also learn that Watchtower is obsessed with persecution stories 
and will regurgitate these stories for decades after the incident has happened because it knows full well that by convincing witnesses that they are this oppressed minority, that they can elicit more loyalty from them and make them feel special and make them feel as though, you know, they're under siege and they need to prove themselves to God, just like these brothers did all these decades ago. And again, I just cannot help but note the tragedy in all of this, because we just heard a story from 1960, apparently was when this courtroom story happened. That's 58 years ago. So 58 years ago, this thing happens in a courtroom that Mark Sanderson goes on JW Broadcasting and talks about. Well, now we have Russia making lives, making the, the lives of Jehovah's Witnesses miserable all over again. So you can imagine how many decades there will, that this sort of thing will be repeated and there will be new stories that will be dredged up for decades to come. And I was thinking, if there was a story happening now in Russia, which there probably will be, of a witness being beaten or harassed or denied work or being made to pay some sum of money. Who knows what's going on in Russia right now? I dread to think. But whatever's happening in Russia right now, you can bet that if Watchtower is around for decades to come, those stories will pop up again. And I was thinking, where does 58 years take us? If there's a story happening right now, where, where would that, when would that be read out if we apply the same time scale? And it would be read out in 2076, <laughs> when I am 97 years old. Probably I won't be alive at 97, but that's a sobering thought, just to kind of highlight how pervasive this stuff is when it comes to Watchtower's persecution complex they really do milk these stories and will continue to milk them for decades to come. When we stand our ground against Satan, firm in the faith, then Jehovah will do just what he promised in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10. Do you see what it says there? But after you have suffered a little while, the God of all undeserved kindness, who called you to his everlasting glory and union with Christ, will himself finish your training. He will make you firm. He will make you strong. He will firmly ground you. So, brothers, can we survive the attack of a roaring lion? Absolutely. With firm faith, let's stand fast and see the salvation from Jehovah. Firm faith is needed to resist the relentless attacks of Satan the devil. The modern day examples brought out in the presentation are truly inspiring. No, they're not inspiring. They're actually kind of desperate and underwhelming. I'm sure that there are more compelling stories from Russia, say, of witnesses being mistreated by authorities during the Soviet era. I'm sure that they could come up with more compelling stories than, oh, these officials were completely incompetent <laughs> and ended up motivating the witnesses rather than demotivating them. But again, how fascinating to see. The, I mean, you get the repeated word attack. We're under attack. Satan's attacking us. We need to stand firm against Satan's attack. Attack, attack, attack. Witnesses need to feel oppressed, apparently, for their faith to make sense. And why would it make sense if they weren't under attack? Because then the scriptures wouldn't apply, where Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. The witnesses absolutely need to feel persecuted for that scripture and others to make any sense at all. So that when you do get governments like Russia for reasons that have nothing to do with them being God's people. I mean, Russia just loves to control people, doesn't it? And here you have this group of people that answers to some group of guys in New York. That's not going to fly with Putin. 
He wants to control everyone. He can control the Orthodox Church. He wants to control Jehovah's Witnesses. They won't let him control them, so he's going to ban them. That's what's happening in Russia. It's not that Putin has some edified, enlightened view of cults and is doing what other governments should be doing. No, he's a thug. This is all about control. It's one cult versus another. It's the Putin personality cult versus the Watchtower cult and Putin's winning in Russia where he can win. But how sad that uh, this is playing right into Watchtower's hands and reinforcing this narrative that Satan is out to get Jehovah's Witnesses because they are God's one true people and why wouldn't they be being attacked in the time of the end? Ecclesiastes 12.1 says to remember then your grand creator in the days of your youth. Young ones, do you find it a challenge to read the Bible every day? A few of your peers have excellent suggestions based on how they do their Bible reading and how they get the most benefit from it. I often put it off until later, so I come home in the evening tired and like to relax. Well, very often I was tired for many different reasons, and that is why I didn't have the motivation even to start Bible reading in the first place. I also had many phases where it was really tough to stick it out with Bible reading. Especially in the age of social media, there are many other things you can fill your day with. Yes, there are. There are lots of things that you can do that are more interesting <laughs> than reading the Bible, especially than reading the Bible through Watchtower's filter, because that's what this is about. We're, you know, we're not talking about gen genuine uh, research into what scholars have to say about the Bible and really digging deep to find out what we know about the origins of certain books and who wrote them and why they were written. No, this is all through Watchtower's literalist filter well, I say literalist, it's a literal interpretation of the Bible, but it's an interpretation that is skewed to promote the Watchtower organisation. Why would that be interesting to a young person? It's going to be boring, and that's what we've just seen um, in these first round of testimonies. We're obviously going to see more. William Turner introduces these testimonies by saying, oh, this is what your peers have to say. And I've made this point before, Watchtower keeps going on about peer pressure and about how young witnesses shouldn't succumb to peer pressure, but apparently they're fine with peer pressure when it's pressure to do things that Watchtower wants. So we want you to feel pressured by these peers because they're telling you to study the Bible through our publications. So yes, do feel pressured by them. Just don't feel pressured by peers who aren't Jehovah's Witnesses. For example, if they are advising you to pursue higher education, because that would be a terrible idea. The weekly Bible reading program has been such a guideline. It's motivating since we discuss this content at the meetings. I could use the study aids in our workbook too. You can better relate to the brothers and sisters' comments because you've read the material yourself. And I can comment too. When I'm reading the Bible in the JW Library app on my phone, there is, of course, the risk that it vibrates and I get a message. And then, of course, you have the urge to check to see who just wrote me. For me personally, then, it's really helpful when I put my phone in airplane mode so that I can really focus on what I'm reading and nothing can distract me. So there's a nice little tip for you, ladies and gentlemen. If you are often distracted when you're researching in JW Library on the JW Library app on your phone, which I'm sure many of you do, um, just be sure to put it in airplane mode. Because the last thing we want is your phone actually being a phone when you need it to be um, a resource of Watchtower instruction. We can't afford any distractions. I mean... Listen, if you're at the point where you're telling people to do that, you're basically acknowledging that your material is really, really boring and not remotely interesting. You should be able to hold people's attention without telling them, please put your phone in airplane mode. Could you imagine if I said in my videos, listen, before you watch this video, 
If you're watching on a phone, please put the phone in airplane mode because what I'm about to tell you is so interesting that I don't want you to have anyone call you while I'm talking to you. There's, there's a degree of insecurity there, I think. I like reading at home, but I also like to do it outdoors because I think that's where you're closest to Jehovah. Why are you closest to Jehovah outdoors? Isn't Jehovah everywhere? For example, one of my hobbies is drawing. I decided one time that I was going to draw the spiritual suit of armor, all of its different parts and their symbolic meanings. And this especially helped me to actually see the benefit. This girl has drawn the spiritual suit of armor with the JW.org logo on the shield because nothing says spirituality more than a logo promoting a website. Each segment in the program has highlighted some way we can build a strong relationship with God. Our music video depicts the joy of marriage where Jehovah is part of a threefold chord, one that cannot quickly be torn apart. The song is called Truly in Love. That comes from above A lovely gift called being in love When two hearts begin to beat as one Then a wonderful time has begun oh. It's simple, so easy and it's something we know with a threefold chord. Love will grow with Jehovah to guide us in all that we do. How I love to be truly in love with someone like you. Someone like you. Oh, someone like you. Um, what can I say? What can I say? That has to be one of the most cringeworthy, in a long line of cringeworthy music videos that JW Broadcasting has produced. I don't know how William Turner can introduce it with a straight face, assuming, of course, that he's heard it in advance. But it's it's like... It's like they they are intentionally shooting themselves in the foot. They are, it's almost like they know how silly this is and they're having a bit of fun at this point. Trials will come our way But our love will grow stronger each day We will build a bond that no one can break we will build a love that no one will take. No, no, no one knows. It's simple, so easy, and it's something we know with a threefold chord. Love will grow with Jehovah to guide us in all that we do. How I love to be truly in love with someone like you. Someone like you. Oh, someone like you. Someone like you. Nothing can destroy our love. Nothing can this destroy. This precious gift is from our God above. As strong as death You are bone of my bones You are flesh of my flesh How do you fit a Barry White style <laughs> love song sort of designed for getting it on? <laughs> How do you fit that 
into an evangelical Christian video and it all look okay? Answer is, you can't. I want you to know how I feel Cause my love for you is so very real I bless the day you came into my life I bless the day I made you my wife Ooh, yes I do it's simple, so easy, and it's something we know with a three-fold chord. Oh, love will grow with Jehovah to guide us in all that we do. How I love to be truly in love with someone like you. So many of our brothers and sisters can agree with the words of that song. With a threefold chord, love will grow. I don't think anyone can be paid enough to appear in a music video like this. I mean, clearly this sweet older couple um, had, were, they probably weren't paid anything. Um, they just thought it was, was this wonderful privilege to be included. Watchtower comes along and says, we'd love you to be in a music video about love. Are you down for that? You know, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> oh, good grief. Um, well, it doesn't really need any commentary. It's, again, one of the most cringeworthy things. One of the most cringeworthy things I've seen on, on these videos. I think we can just leave it at that. But that brings us to the end of the April 2018 JW Broadcasting episode, which again was hosted by William Turner Jr. What can I say? Um, a, a blatant celebration of the control the Watchtower has over Jehovah's Witnesses, where Jehovah's Witnesses are infantilized and made to embrace the fact that they are to think of themselves as children, as helpless, as completely clueless if they didn't have a bunch of guys in New York telling them what to do, even in such areas as medical choices, blood transfusions, and even to the point where Watchtower gets to tell millions of Jehovah's Witness women that under no circumstances can they have an abortion. And again, I cannot stress enough how negligent that kind of advice is. That sort of advice kills people, quite frankly. So that's pretty much everything I have to say on the April broadcasting episode. I will, of course, be making more of these rebuttals next month. But for now, I hope you have enjoyed my thoughts on JW Broadcasting. And as always, thank you for watching. <laughs>